The expansion of revolutionary France at the end of the 18th century upset the fragile balance of power in Europe. In a handful of years, accelerated by the energy and ambition of Napoleon, who had risen to power on a wave of military victories, the existing world order, empires, trade routes and dynasties were under challenge. As new peoples, ideas and technologies rose to the surface, naval and battlefield clashes determined not just lines on the maps, but the future of liberty, slavery, colonies and commerce. The Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars saw conflict being carried out on a scale previously unseen in Europe. While the battles of the 17th century were fought between small armies, rarely with more than 50,000 on each side, the biggest conflicts of the Napoleonic Wars saw much larger armies frequently clash on battlefields from Russia to Portugal. In Leipzig in 1813, known as the Battle of the Nations, almost 600,000 soldiers engaged. Besides desperately struggling to find and to fund European allies, the British would have to adapt their army's tactics and develop new technology to oppose the might of the French. One of the key determinants of the British Army's effectiveness was how far it could rely on the industrial engine of the economy back home. For the Industrial Revolution, starting in the 18th century, really opened the door for the nations of Europe to conduct war on this entirely new scale. We're exploring this subject at Dover Castle, home to one of many regimental museums whose collections chart the military history of the United Kingdom. Dover was extensively remodelled during the Napoleonic Wars, becoming a barracks and a garrison town as the British responded to fears of French invasion. So how did the Industrial Revolution impact the way that war was fought throughout the Napoleonic era? The Industrial Revolution had a huge impact on how war was fought in this period, and particularly in terms of its scale and intensity. Um, so with the ability for armies to, um, to expand, so the British Army expands from you know, about 40,000 in the early 1790s to a high of 250,000 by 1813, alongside that you need to have the production capabilities to arm and clothe them. So you see huge expansion in armaments industry, uh, be that in terms of uh, rifles and muskets, or down to bayonets and swords, munitions, transports, all these sorts of things to, to keep pace with the expanding armies. And the reason that these armies are expanding is not, is not just because they're fighting on the European continent, but they're fighting across the world, and the Industrial Revolution helps that as well. So there, there are battles happening across multiple continents, on the high seas, so the production of ships uh, is equally as important. And the British actually have uh, a leg up in this facet of, of things because they have a, a big empire that they can draw on, markets that they can tap into, which, say, um, other nations don't really have. And on top of that, the British are able to raise taxes um, and, and loans from an intricate banking system to bankroll not just the expansion of their own armies, but also those of their continental allies. So Britain really becomes the, the linchpin for many of these coalitions fighting. On the battlefield itself, the Industrial Revolution has a big impact because for the first time, really, you have a really firepower-dominated battlefield. Okay, a lot of this is still to, to do with muskets and, and black powder, but that has an impact in terms of, of noise, in terms of smoke filling the battlefield, which makes it a very chaotic place and places an increasing importance on the discipline and courage of individual soldiers and the command and control of junior officers as well. What we're looking at here are two living historians who are dressed up as British and French infantrymen of the Napoleonic period. And the British one is in a red coat, the French is in blue. What the infantrymen had to do was to carry enough equipment and kit uh, for himself for up to about 10 or 12 days. So these men are carrying quite a lot of equipment, probably something like 20, 25 kilograms in weight. And the haversacks that, that both have, these are sort of what would be called now day bags in the army. So these are things that people can reach into very easily. They might also have some spare ammunition uh, in that. But their main ammunition supply is in their cartridge boxes and both men would be carrying about 60 rounds of ammunition. The living historians that we have with us today have got uniforms that have been made to a very high standard and if we were looking at men of the time we would probably see an even more marked difference between the uniforms of the officers and of the, the private soldiers. The private soldiers uniform would have been made of a much coarser cloth, so a cheaper type of cloth and wouldn't have been put together 
quite as well as the officers. So officers bought their own uniforms and would go to specialist tailors to have these made up very carefully for them. We'd probably have a number of spare uniforms, whereas a private soldier might be expected to try and make uh, a uniform jacket last for two to three years, uh, which meant that after a short period of time, a lot of them would have been very heavily patched. The other thing you will notice about the officers is that they don't really have to carry very much. They had servants who carried a lot of the equipment for them and they would also um, have a, a share in a, a regimental baggage train so there would be horses and carts on which they would have a lot of their equipment. Throughout the 18th century, the British Army was armed with flintlock muskets, generally known as Brown Bess muskets, with a less expensive design, the India pattern, introduced from the 1770s that reflected the East India Company's extensive investment in military arms. The musket had an effective range of 100 yards, although fire was often reserved until the enemy was within 50 yards to maintain accuracy. The British Army also introduced a new weapon to their rifle regiments, the Patton 1800 rifle, more commonly known as the Baker rifle. We have here a living historian who's dressed in the uniform of the 95th Rifles and this was a specialist regiment that was formed in 1800 as a, the premier sort of light infantry regiment of the British Army and he's armed with the Baker rifle which was uh, effectively an industrially produced rifle. The rifle that he has would have very great accuracy compared to a musket, so there would be a good chance of him being able to hit a target at 400 yards, 400 metres, uh, whereas with a musket about 50 yards, more or less 50 metres, would have been uh, maximum range. You'll see that the rifleman here is in a green outfit. Partly that goes back to sort of German hunting traditions, back to the American War of Independence, but we could see it as one of the first examples of camouflage being used in the British Army. So when we think of soldiers now, we think of them in, in uh, green or brown uniforms, and this is a very early example of that. Both weapons had their advantages. While the musket could fire three shots per minute, the rifle could only fire a single shot, but with much greater accuracy. These weapons were muzzle-loaded, meaning the shot was loaded into the gun via the barrel. The flintlock mechanism involved the user pulling back the hammer of the gun, causing a flint to strike the flush pan containing a small amount of gunpowder. This would ignite and propel the projectile from the barrel. The French army could not yet mass-produce rifles and still relied on muskets. The Baker rifle was not supreme on larger battlefields, however. The British saw it being outranged by American farmers' custom-made rifles during the Battle of New Orleans in 1815. French and American soldiers were also known to use buck and ball ammunition in their guns. This meant they would load their barrel with a small number of buckshot pellets as well as the standard musket shot. While hindering the range and accuracy of the weapon, this made for a devastating impact on the targets that it met. Another development in the technology of warfare during the Napoleonic Wars was the invention of the Congreve rocket. This was a new type of rocket artillery used primarily by the British Navy. They had some problems of accuracy and stability, especially in strong winds, although they did have a high rate of fire compared to the standard cannon. They were used successfully by the British during the bombardment of Copenhagen and during the Battle of Waterloo. As with breakthrough technologies, in the wake of the wars, a number of countries adopted the weapon and established special rocket brigades, such as Britain's own British Army Rocket Brigade in 1818. By the late 19th century, however, they used to climb. An important part of the development of the British Army during this period was not just their access to newer technology, but also the way in which they used it. The brand new Baker rifle was primarily used by specialist rifle regiments, such as the 60th and the 95th, part of the British Army's light infantry. From the early years of the war, Britain expanded the number of light infantry regiments, but most of these remained armed with muskets so they could maintain a high rate of fire. So why was it now that the British Army decided to create these regiments dedicated to light infantry? OK, well, the French had shown how effective light infantry could be in the early campaigns of the French Revolutionary Wars. They had trained marksmen that acted ahead of the main body of their army and then killed the enemy officers and non-commissioned officers, so left the enemy regiments effectively leaderless and prone then to, to, to retreat, break down and, and do all that. Um, 
The other side is that the British Army manages to set up what are effectively large training camps in the south of England to do with the threatened French invasion. You suddenly get a concentration of forces which hadn't really been seen in the peacetime army. So just up the road really from where we are today at Shorncliffe, you get the Light Brigade put together, the 43rd and 52nd Redcoat Regiments and the newly formed 95th Regiment, what later becomes the Rifle Brigade. So how did these regiments operate differently to just regular uh, regiments in the British Army? Well, they can do really the same things as normal regiments can do, so they're highly trained in all that foot drill and so on that, that infantry have to be able to do in the Napoleonic Wars. But on top of that, they're trained uh, specialists in marksmanship, particularly the riflemen uh, with the Baker rifle. They had a good chance of killing someone at about 200 yards, perhaps as much as 400 yards, whereas the musket would only have been about 50 yards. Uh, so there's an element of, of trained marksmanship. They're trained also in reconnaissance and scouting activity, so going ahead of the main body of the army and feeding back intelligence to the commanders. And then when the worst happens, they're trained as experts in rearguard actions, so holding up an enemy advance and letting the bulk of the army getting away, as they do later on the Corona campaign. Great. Thanks for your time, Tim. So, Corey, I was wondering if you could tell us about the Battle of Albuera as an example of British action in the peninsula during these wars. So the Battle of Albuera was fought outside the village of Albuera, which is about 20 kilometres out of Barrios, which is um, a Spanish fort town. It was fought um, by a joint Anglo-Portuguese and Spanish army against the French in 1811. So we we're in the midst of the Peninsula War, and like many other battles um, up to this time in the Peninsula War, it is a stalemate. But the Battle of Albuera stands out, to, at least to us at the PWRR and Queen's Regiment Museum, because one of the bloodiness of the action and two of the heroism and bravery of many of the soldiers who make up the forebear regiments of the current Princess of Wales's and Royal Regiment and Queen's Regiment. They're fighting on the slopes of a hill outside of Albuera itself. The Spanish have only joined the British, British Anglo-Portuguese army the night before and the French are not quite aware of that, but the battle starts 9.30 in the morning on the slopes of the hill and starts with very heavy musketry, very heavy fighting. The Spanish um, uh, uh, line barely holds, but it holds, and that's the important thing. So the French have to change tact, and they change tact at 10.30 that morning because there is a massive hail and rainstorm that suddenly falls upon the battlefield. And getting their slink knot musket mechanisms wet means that they can no longer fire and therefore a change of tactics is required. So the French then send in a massive cavalry onslaught on, um, onto the right side of their army. Now, the 31st Regiment of Foot managed to get themselves into what's called a square formation and therefore they managed to fend off the worst of the casualties, but the 3rd Regiment of Foot, unprepared, in two straight lines, are met by the full onslaught of the French and the Polish Lancers, and they meet no quarter. We think that four-fifths of the buffs lose their lives in that particular onslaught, and the 31st Regiment of Foot, who are in a square formation, you would think would do slightly better. Of the 425 men they have on the field, we think they lose about half. So it's bloody and it's sustained and it is a complete onslaught and then the battle pauses for a moment and has a hiatus as everyone kind of picks themselves up again. In general the British army preferred to organise regiments in a line formation by which lines of soldiers often two men deep fired in coordinated volleys. Napoleon on the other hand often favoured the column formation which involved much deeper ranks of about 60 men or a mixed order which involved a line followed by two columns forming a u-shape. In this formation the better trained men would often be at the front, forming the line, while volunteers and conscripts, who were less capable with their muskets, would form the columns behind. So can you tell me about the, uh, the line, column and mixed formations and the advantages and disadvantages of using these? Absolutely. So what we have to remember here is that warfare has changed from the 17th century, where it was dominated by pikemen. Um, all of a sudden, with the introduction of the socket bayonet, um, you have both elements of shock and firepower in one man in the infantry. They can have a musket that fires, but also that cold steel on the end of it to act as, as the old pike. And this really changes um, tactics in the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. Lieutenant Matthew Latham, in desperation, picks up the colours from the ensign who's lost his life, who was holding them beforehand, and shoves them inside his, inside his jacket. And he is taken on by the French, he loses an arm, he is slashed across the face, and he is left for dead. But he survived the battle, 
somehow and the colours were kept safe. And Latham, for his achievement, was given what's known as the first plastic surgery, which the Prince Regent himself um, actually funded. And um, the regiment remember him through three glorious pieces called the Latham centrepieces, which are solid silver um, centrepieces of the table in, in recognition of his achievement. So he is on the battlefield. The rest of his regiment have gone to join the other side of the battle. And again, they find themselves in an incredibly bloody slaughter. The 57th Regiment of Foot and their heroism, their bravery and their tenacity is the only thing that stops it from being a complete and utter blow up for the British at that point. Um, their commander, Colonel William Inglis, has been hot hit with a bit of grape shot in the neck and he is lying on the ground shouting to his, to his men, die hard 57th, die hard, which is where we get that phrase from. Um, it's kept in the popular, popular um, lingua franca of the day now and Bruce Willis owes it to the 57th Regiment of Foot. Of the people who are there from the 57th, 88% of officers and 83% of ordinary men lose their lives. But because of their tenacity and their, the fact they keep going throughout the odds, the French eventually do have to withdraw. And in the aftermath of that slaughter, and the remaining officers from the 57th Regiment of Foot met in an inn and held what is known as the Silent Toast. The French armies of the, the period tended to uh, mix and match a little bit. So um, there's a popular perception that they only used the column formation, where they have fewer men in the front rank, but it goes much deeper than the, than the line. This had its advantages um, because it was more manoeuvrable um, and it had a, a shock value. They could basically charge at an enemy line and try and break it, but would have fewer muskets to, to fire. And even something like the British Army, they don't just stay in line uh, for the entire battle. Famously at Waterloo, the British infantry form square to counter the French cavalry, for instance. So it's, it's always evolving. So I imagine that training and drilling would have been quite a big part of maintaining these formations. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, really important. And, and this is also where junior officers become uh, really uh, essential to good command and control. Um, junior officers are quite often tasked with training their men, um, but the difficulties that many armies find uh, is the uh, to, to find the time to, to do this. Um, quite often regiments are, are not always billeted in the same place or barracked at the same place, they're dispersed, so to get a unit together to, to train and drill them properly um, can sometimes be, be difficult, but um, a lot of emphasis is placed on it um, so that men know exactly what they're meant to do when they're meant to do it in the heat of battle so that they can coordinate their fire plans um, because it's not just about discharging your muskets all in one go sometimes they do it by platoon so that there's continuous fire from the left of the line right the way down to the right um, or, or vice versa uh, and all of this takes time and, and, and training. So you mentioned artillery and cavalry and I was wondering if you could tell us uh, how those were used throughout these wars as well. So cavalry and artillery also see um, big changes tactically um, during this time um, because of this new firepower dominated battlefield. Um, so cavalry sees its role uh, almost diminished a little bit, not quite as much as, as we'll see in, in later wars, uh, later in the 19th century and into the 20th, but uh, this idea of cavalry being the shock force to be deployed at the decisive point in the battle and the big charge of the heavy cavalry, that's still what they want to be doing and it still does happen. But what you start to see more of is cavalry taking on secondary roles. So they'll be used, in, like cavalry for instance, in reconnaissance, um, to scout out the, the enemy army and its movements. Uh, you'll see them screening the army, so basically covering its flanks as an army moves from one place to another. Um, and, and so the, the shock and awe that they, they want to be part of um, doesn't always come to fruition. And, and depending on where they're fighting, cavalry can be more or less effective. So in the rugged terrain and, and harsh conditions of, of Spain, you don't see a lot of cavalry, particularly heavy cavalry, but say somewhere like the the Netherlands, the, the Low Countries, um, you see it quite a lot. So famously the first lifeguards charge at the Battle of Catapa just before uh, the Battle of Waterloo and the Scots Greys infamously charge um, at the Battle of Waterloo itself and incur quite a few casualties as a result. In terms of artillery, um, this is a really interesting one because again it adds to that firepower dynamic. The British tended to line up their guns across their battle line and not move them hugely. They used to use them more as, as counter-battery work to, to fire on the enemy's guns. Napoleon, being an artilleryman himself, had a few more ideas, 
about using artillery, he tended to mass them together in what were called grand batteries to try and pound the enemy at the decisive point, try to make it as manoeuvrable as possible so that he could bring it to bear exactly where he needed to, to soften the enemy before an infantry or a cavalry advance. And just to give you an indication as to the importance and the increasing importance of artillery as the wars progressed, in 1805 at the Battle of Austerlitz, uh, the French had about two guns for every thousand men. By the time you get to the Battle of Leipzig in 1813, that's three and a half guns for every thousand men. So there's an increasing importance placed on, uh, on artillery. And just one final example, at the Battle of Borodino in 1812, it's estimated that uh, somewhere around 90,000 um, artillery rounds are fired by both sides, the French and, and the Russians, and nearly two million cartridges. So we are really starting to talk about a technological battlefield uh, where firepower is king. By 1800, warfare looked very different from the 1650s. Armies were much larger and the Industrial Revolution meant that infantry soldiers were now all armed with muskets rather than with pikes. Wellington had few cavalry regiments with his army in the Peninsula War, as they were difficult to transport and required large supplies of food. His army at Waterloo, however, had a large cavalry contingent and the shock action delivered by them using their swords were important in securing Allied victory. As ever, the development of tactics and technology in warfare during this era moved hand in hand, as communications, transport and technology evolved, allowing for larger and better equipped armies, the armies of Britain, France and many other protagonists in the wars of the Age of Revolution adjusted to adapt. New kinds of units, more flexible formations, more emphasis on artillery and longer ranged weapons became commonplace. But the old staples of good drilling, good provisioning and swift manoeuvring remained critical to battlefield success, explaining the strong performance and mobility of French armies in many instances during the wars. Mm -hmm.